Sharon, very nice to uh, to connect with you, and um, you know, thanks for taking the time to sort of answer a few of my questions. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. It's my pleasure. You're 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 touring right now, right? Or, no, maybe you haven't started the tour, but you're going to start. No, no, I'm on tour. I've been on tour since the first of June. I've okay. been home for only eight days since the first of June, so I've just been on the go. We are playing in a town called Luga in Spain tonight. Okay. In the Galicia area. And it's it's a European tour, right? No, I just finished the American tour yesterday. Oh, well, well, okay. So now I'm on the final European leg. Okay. And I, I wanted to ask you, actually, because you, you know, you know what, you've been doing this since you were a kid, right? Playing music, touring, and how, you know... How do you like? How has it evolved? You know, since you you, you started, and how, and how do you find sort of? Do you still find joy and and ways to challenge yourself in a way? Well, you know, I I've been touring with my band professionally now since two thousand and eight, so almost twenty years we've been on tour. You know, and before that, you know, I was touring with my dad. You know, and I have to say that the only reason I keep going is because there's a there's a mission. You know, I'm in touch with my, and this is not, I'm not saying this because I'm better than anybody, but I think I'm in touch with myself. And this comes with a lot of, it comes with maturity, you know, a lot of introspection, a lot of studying, a lot of non Chomsky reading. <laughs> grounding myself in my true class consciousness also has made me realize you know because many people in the world are not grounded they live in a dream everybody thinks they are the next Bill Gates you know the class consciousness in the world is very weak because the Bill Gates of this world have reduced people to uh, snippets and uh, and kick baits and things like that. So people don't know that they have to be grounded in class consciousness. And this for me is the ultimate struggle for humanity. And grounding yourself in your class and understanding what the collaboration between you and nature defines the mission for you. If you were able to do that, it begins to define your mission. So I went through all this way just to say that I'm able to do what I do still and find the ways to make it satisfying because it is my mission. The mission is the message. The message is the music. The music is the message. And both are the mission, you know? So yeah, that's how I'm able to keep evolving because the systems that we continue to confront continue to evolve also. So the fact that I know my enemy and I'm confronting my enemy with my talents means that I have to evolve with the movement of the times and let my art reflect the situation that we are in because that is what makes it art. Yeah, so, so, so for you, music and politics are connected. Everything and politics are connected. Everything and politics. You know, uh, I forgot who said this famous saying, but even when people say this is not political, that is a political statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, everything is political, you know. <laughs> and you know, and, you know, Archbishop Tutu, you know, Desmond Tutu from South Africa, were saying like, you know, if you're neutral, being neutral is actually political, right? Not taking a stand, not yeah. is political. Yeah, when people say, "Oh, my music is not political," I always tell them that is a political statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and talking about politics, I, want, I actually wanted to focus a bit on Nigeria because I feel like in in Western Europe, not a lot of people know what's happening in Nigeria or what has happened in Nigeria in the last few decades. And um, and in a way, I think Nigeria is sort of the, the prime example on how colonialism, a police state, corruption, and international corporation greed can destroy. Uh, a whole c country. So, can you tell me a bit? Because I know you've you've been involved in many campaigns in Nigeria. Um, can you tell me, like for example, you know the end SARS, you know the special anti-robbery squad. 
can you tell me a bit, a bit more about what has happened in the last 10 years or 20 years and, and where oh, you are now? Yeah. The emphasis is a good focal point, not only to see how imperialism works in cahoots with its local representatives, but the also it exposes the double standards of the international community. I mean, looking at Iran, the Iranian protests, you know, and the covering of the Iranian government and the U.S.'s government already talking about sanctions, you know. But during the NSAS protest, the Nigerian government did the same thing to the young protesters. You know, the U.S. government did not come out to talk about our sanctions or any punishment for our... In fact, many of our police were trained, many of these SARS police were trained in the US and the, and the UK. But that being said, you know, throughout the NSAS, and not until now, I've been trying to, and we have created a movement that is going to become a political party. It's called the Movement of the People. It was founded by my father but they never got it to the political party stage because they refused to register it. And we've picked up the mantle now in this generation again to bring that battle cry forward, to bring that torch forward, to make sure that that mission is not over. And we create a platform to truly represent our people. You know, it is, that is imperative. Uh, but what is important is to say also at this point is uh, Nigeria is a, uh, is truly a, a very imperialist nation. You know, it's a new colonialist hotbed of activity. You know, I mean, going back to the All African People's Congress in 1958, the first All African People's chaired by Nkrumah, uh, where All Africa, where he was calling for the Nigeria, uh, for the whole of Africa to unite and face the imperialists and the colonialists. The most prominent, the only country that refused in that area that countered him was Nigeria. They were the, you know, so Nigeria has well, very well been a place where the true revolutionaries, people like my grandmother, people like pa, pa Michael Imodu, um, uh, people like the Aba women, the coal miners of Enugu, who actually fought for our independence, who gave their lives, gave blood, were mal maligned out of the uh, independence movements where the colonialists were able to pick this, their protégés, that they are trained in Western thought. And so these people believe that if it's white, then it's right. They cannot think outside of whiteness. You know, they... They, they cannot even relate with their people who cannot be white, you know. So that's why you see, and many of them are also descendants of slave traders. You know, this is one connection that are never, that is not often made in Africa, that many of the leaders in Africa, you know, and that's why we had a lot of military coups. You know, you have to understand what is the military in Africa? What does it mean? Who are the soldiers in Africa? Who are these military men before we got independence? You know, the military men in my country, are nothing but the Africans that were willing to kill other Africans to protect European interests. That was what they were under colonialism. And after our countries got independence, we inherited these men, these Africans, who are willing to kill other Africans for colonial interests. We inherited them as our army. You know? So these were people that were agents of colonialism. Their fathers before them, the ones that trained them as army, used to be slave catchers. For, for imperialism and slavery. So this is the evolution of this set of African leaders that we have. They, they went from slave catcher, agent of the slave trader, to agent of colonialism, murdering their brothers and sisters to keep a illegal system in place. And when we rose up and defeated their masters, their masters used them to usurp all our independence movement all over Africa. So from Ghana to Nigeria to Algeria to uh, Congo to um, Guinea to uh, Kenya. Before five years of independence, we've all gone through military coups. And Africa was under military coup for about 50 years after that. 
you know, to make sure that they are boys, these slave catchers, African yeah. killer descendants. And I guess put in Sorry. place a yeah. system that keeps Africans subjugated for them and their masters. You understand? Yeah, yeah. So basically, that's the big picture. You know, yeah. we are fighting agents of imperialism, you know, who disguise themselves as our leaders. And they get this big support from their true business partners, mm. the multinational corporations, the international media, and their governments. Yeah, Lenin actually said at one point that imperialism was the, le the last stage of capitalism. Uh, and, and I think Nigeria is a prime example of that. I wanted to ask also about, you were saying like, I guess the people that rebel and that, you know, the dissenters, um, I mean, the state is most of the time on the side of the corporations and the West, right? If, you, if we think about uh, Ken Sarowiwa, for example, that yeah. was executed 25 years ago um, because he was fighting and asking for Shell, you know, who was um, extract, extracting oil in the Niger Delta uh, for uh, accountability. He was executed by, by the state. I was wondering, actually, this kind of murders, you know, by the state, um, in your opinion, what are the consequences for the movement? You know, because it's obviously to scare people to go into action, but what, what's your opinion? I don't, I don't think it's the fear that's the big consequence of this action. The big consequence of the elimination of African leaders that are truly African, not the misleaders, you know, not the rulers, okay? We have rulers and then we have leaders. The execution of our leaders in Africa creates a situation whereby every generation of African people everywhere in the world, not only in Nigeria, we have to start our movement from scratch without mentorship. This is the big problem. You know, you have parties in America and in UK that and in Europe that are hundreds of years old. And whatever changes are coming, these people can build upon, stand on the shoulders of these things and build upon these parties. And you know, so it's a continual process. But in Africa, we are we are we Africans all over the world are left with a situation where every generation has to mentor themselves, have to work ourselves up, have to find our past because. The history of African leadership is nothing but a history of European assassinations, you know, and American manipulations and things like that. So we don't have people like uh, Franz Fanon to call on to. We yeah. don't have people like Lumumba to look up to. We don't have people Ankara. like Sankara. Yeah. We don't have people like uh, uh, Oliver Tambo anymore. We don't have uh, we don't have Shikuturi anymore. You know. Many of these leaders today could have been in their 70s, 80s, and we could look up and get mentorship and get. So this is one of the big issues. But today, due to the proliferation of private capital into all the institutions of the world, especially that of media and education, and especially entertainment, they do not really have to be that aggressive with dissenters. So people like you and I, we just never get on CNN and BBC or MTV or Trace or any of the major platforms in the world mm. that gets people's attention because they have controlled people's attention into their control. I mean, they have herded people's attention into a few platforms that they control. So people look up to these platforms for validation, you know, and uh, yeah. their main job is to make sure that no dissenting voice is on those platforms, you know. You were talking about Noam Chomsky at the beginning, right? He wrote a, a book with uh, Edward Hellman called um, Manufacturing Consent. Consent, yes, I have. You know, the way the, the media is exactly. obviously the corporate yeah, part of the problem. And it's, and it's, I think that's a, a crucial issue as well for, for the youth and the movement to reclaim, in a way, the media. And, and that's something that uh, is, is super important. And, um, but I, I also wanted to talk about one of the most, I mean, the most crucial, I think, issues, issue of our time, which is cl climate change um, and, and, and the denial that some leaders and, and, you know, are, are trying to, to, to do. But, um, I mean, Ken Saro, we were in a way, was also fighting against the impact of what shell drilling in the Niger Delta was going to cause. And, but you said one day that um, for you, climate change was man's ultimate 
manifestation of lack of love. What, what do you mean by that? Yes, I mean, um, if we are willing to destroy nature for profit, for not because there's nothing happening, but just so people can get rich, it's not as if there's this grand idea behind this sacrifice. You know, okay, maybe we are sacrificing the well-being of our environment because there's this thing we have to save or this thing we are building that in the longer run will be better for us and the, I can understand this massive extraction and greed and madness. So if we can reach this state, this level, then definitely the world is run by people that are broken. You know, truly broken men and women. You know, these men and women are so broken that they cannot love the sea because they do not own it. They cannot love the rivers. They cannot love the Amazon forest because it is not their own. The only way they can understand love is by ownership. You know, this demented idea that own, because with ownership comes control. And truly, so that is not love, it's just a way to control. You know, so what we have in the world today is plenty of controlling freaks, narcissists, but little love, you know. So yeah. And as an African, I want I like I don't want to talk about climate change anymore. It's an insult to my ancestors to talk about climate change as an African. Because this is why we are called savages. Because we treated nature like it was alive. Europeans said nature is dead. It's, it's abstract. It's a thing. We engage with nature like it was alive. And they say we are savages for being one with nature. Now, today, everybody is talking about climate change and going green. Whereas, up until today, what is the carbon footprint of Africans? Let's look at it. New York alone, I'm sure, has more carbon outage than the whole of Africa combined. California alone, I'm sure, has a more carbon footprint than the whole of Africa combined. So why am I talking about climate change? It is not my problem, you know. And if the world see, does not believe in the power of nature to balance things out in its own way, you know. I was telling a friend of mine yesterday, the partitioning of Africa, was done by um, Bers, 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 Bersmark Otto von Bers, the German Chancellor in 1888. And after he did that, Germany suffered two world war defeats. Now, in that war, two world wars, millions of Europeans killed themselves for no reason whatsoever. That is natural. You don't understand. <laughs> African, Af this African proverb that says, he who the gods will kill, first they make mad. You can't go all over the world killing indigenous people for their resources for 200 years. Then you settle down now. Because in the 18th, 19th century, in the 19th century, to the beginning of the 20th century, Europe is supposed to enjoy the spoils of all this. Now it's the industrial revolution. Now it's technology. Now it's time to enjoy all this theft, all this pillage, all this murder. Oh, instead, what have they been doing since, 19, since 1914, one war after the other? Europe has not known peace. It has not been able to enjoy this loot properly. Yes, they are enjoying in some way. But 60 million dead from the Second World War alone, Vietnam, Korea, everywhere, constantly. So this is nature. Still. This is something beyond us. This is something beyond us still, making sure that you yeah. know, humanity see the injustice in the system that we live in. You understand? No African created the world wars. We're not involved, yeah. exactly. But the same people that killed and destroyed us, killed and destroyed themselves, mm. <laughs> nonstop. But yeah, we, we, now, yeah. now is nature. Right, so now is nature, nature is the new frontier. They feel that man has been oppressed so much because we are nothing but the voice of nature. Really, that is what nature creates. We, we, we are put here by, by these powerful systems and forces, you know, to be the eyes, ears, nose, mouth, emotion of nature. In a way, nature wants to know itself. We are the way nature is supposed to know itself. And then we think we are bigger.
you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I think, you know, this state of permanent war is also crucial for capitalism to, to survive, yes, right? Course. Because you of scare course. people with war, you sell more weapons, you and you know the more people are yeah, scared, the more they listen. Before, right? before they were using it to scare the indigenous people. Yeah. But now they are scaring themselves. Yeah. <laughs> you know. And you you also said something very interesting because I think colonialism and imperialism also starts with destroying a people's culture and identity. And you said something in an interview. Uh, talking about the people of the African continent, uh, I think it was an interview for Le Monde in France. You said, um, basically, you go to hell if you are black. You know, and uh, so do you think this feeling in a way is ingrained still in African minds or it's of emancipating course. I mean, now? <laughs> in every African church, it is still um, white Jesus, right? Uh, Lucifer is still black, you know. Definitely, we have this uh, uh, notion that blackness, black spirituality, you know, in my country, even when the priests, they preach in church, they talk about African spirituality as demon worship, you know, and things like that. So, yeah, for sure. Basically, imperialism just says, what they taught us is, you know, white is right, you know. So most people automatically, black is wrong. And yeah, you are right. You are black, you go to hell. Because being African means you, not just, it doesn't mean just your skin, right? To be truly African means you embody and promote the African worldview. So you move in African spirituality. You, uh, you are a Pan-Africanist and you are committed to the advancement of African people. These three things are, are the easiest way to go to hell, according to Islam and Christianity. You know, that means you are worshipping other gods. You worship the African gods. You know, if you, uh, you know, in the Bible and the Quran, it is wrong to stand up to authority because leaders are chosen by God. So if you... If you talk to your, if you talk wrong to your leader, it means what? It means that you are offending God. So what does that mean? It means African people who are already oppressed, embracing this religion means that many of them cannot even fight for their rights. If you fight for your rights, doing the African thing, you are going to hell. Whatever you do that is African is the surest way of going to hell. <laughs> I wanted to, I mean, I've got two more questions. So uh, because we, we've we been in touch recently, thanks to actually a, a common friend, Brian Eno. I think he put us in touch <laughs> three months ago or something. Yeah. Um, what is, in your opinion, the role of artists in, in the struggle for social justice? Um, uh, yeah. You know, in the world today, I, I always say a lot of people, the job of artists is to create the inspiration the soundtrack for the movement after the inspiration the you know the recording of it the uh how do i where do you put it now you know putting it down for history and things like that this is the job of our artists you know capturing the moments you know the inspirational things and things like that but how i feel also in the world that too, too much pressure is put on artists like only this profession is supposed to change the world but the engineers of this world, the civic engineers, electric engineers, whatever, electrical engineers, petrochemical engineers, they have more roles to play than artists. They are the ones that have to come up with the designs that will not harm nature. They are the ones that have to insist that their talents will preserve humanity. You know, what can happen if the lawyers don't change? If the lawyers don't use the law for good, if the lawyers don't use the law to advance humanity, if the lawyers don't use the law to defend humanity, what use is music? What can music really do? You know, if, you, if the doctors refuse to be about the health of the people, if the doctors do not embrace the patients, if the doctors do not use their medicine to heal the world, 
instead of just healing the rich, what use can music do? Who, who can even listen to music when they are sick and not feeling well and can dance? You know, so I think this whole uh, scope, you know, uh, uh, narrative about artists having the power to change is also a sinister ploy by the masters of the universe to keep the professionals out of the struggle. Only musicians are allowed to speak. But no, only artists can't speak. Lawyers must speak. Doctors, engineers, accountants, parliamentarians, uh, directors of, I mean, banks, even bankers have to change. You know, yeah, so yeah, you're, and, uh, until they, yeah. well, if they think that what they're doing is necessary and they don't, it is not a frontier in the class struggle, then there's nothing music or artists can really do that would move things. You know, this is what I really think. And I, I always want to say this so that everyday people know that the struggle needs them too, you know. And, and finally, so you recently agreed to sign a, a letter signed by more than 1,500 musicians uh, saying, today we speak together and demand justice, dignity, and the right to self-determination for the Palestinian people and all who we are fighting, uh, and all who we are fighting colonial dispossession and violence across the planet. So to end, in a way, the, this conversation, um, what does, in a way, Palestine and the Palestine struggle represent uh to you and, and you know you know i mean um there's no palestinian struggle for me you know i'm an african my history with other peoples of the world is not the same as yours europea when i speak about the oppression of palestine i'm not talking on behalf of the palestinian people i'm talking on the platform of indigenous people, all victims of imperialism, you know. Many Arab nations in, the, nations in the world, even on the African continent, discriminate against African people. Recently, I canceled a show in Morocco because of the death of African migrants trying to cross the border, they opened fire and massacred them there. In Libya, Africans are taken as slaves there. Again, you know, in Saudi Arabia, so many uh, reports of mistreatment, death, murder of African pilgrims, and all to cheering Arab crowds. You know, as the great um, Henry Clark said, as the great late Henry Clark, one of Africa's foremost sons, an awesome philosopher and historian said Africans don't owe anybody anything but an ass whooping. <laughs> so for me, when I speak about things in Palestine, in Palestine, I talk against imperialism. I know the enemy, you know. I'm not talking from a point of view, I'm in solidarity with this because nobody's in solidarity with African people. Africa is the only continent in the world where everybody's united in our exploitation. <laughs> United in our humiliation, uh, united in our oppression. From the Arabs in the north, north, north of Africa to the Europeans in the south of Africa, we go through the same thing. But it doesn't mean that we do not see. You know, so it is that site that has allowed me to sign the paper against the Palestinians because hopefully maybe they too will understand coming out of what they are going through, they will not become another Israel. You understand? Because Israel came out of the apartheid holocaust and became a holocaust apartheid nation because they are tied to imperialism. That's what imperialism does. When you, when you seek equality with your oppressor, you become your oppressor. So that's why I never fight for Africans to have equality in this system. We don't want equality with our oppressor. Because equality with your oppressor makes you what? Your oppressor. We don't want that. And we don't want to be victims of oppression. We are enemies of oppression. We are enemies of our oppressor. 
So we are trying to kill oppression. We are trying to destroy oppression. There's no middle ground for us with oppression. You understand? So yeah, uh, the Palestinian uh, front is a important front for that battle. You know, of eradicating oppression. You know, but it must go with education, so that people do not become to others what you know. Because many people in the world today they justify hurting other people, they justify greed, they justify so many things because it was done to them. Oh, this thing happened to me, so it's okay for me to do it. We must change our mindsets. We must teach people that your pain does not justify causing pain on others. You know, in fact, your pain should be a motivation to eradicate pain, not to spread pain. You know, so yeah. Hey, thanks, brother. I think that was a, a beautiful way to to end the the conversation. And um, so, yeah, th thanks again. And um, I wish you all the best for the the rest of the tour. When, when do you actually finish? In a, a couple November. Of November. Whoa. Yeah, and then you can rest. Oh, yeah. You can go home, right? Yeah. I I wish I, I wish you let me rest when I'm home. I, I just wish you know. Hopefully, I'm going to run into a hole when I'm home and just hide. <laughs> Wait okay. okay hey lots of love to you and, and your family and thanks again shun thanks bye. bro bye bye bye, bye.